taken Ronnie's place this morning and somehow I fell into the crucifixion of Jesus. That's what I got left with. Uh, doing so, I've been tasked with what I consider one of the three most important scriptures in the Bible. The birth, the death, and the resurrection. I got the middle one. Uh, someone very near and dear to me at one time, somebody unsaved, uh, this last Easter I was talking to them. And uh, they told me they didn't quite understand the holiday of Easter because uh, they don't know why in the world we're celebrating the death of our Savior, Richard. They don't get it. And uh, there's someone very logical and someone who, who tries to think about everything in their life and has a logical explanation for everything. And uh, I, I respect them for that. And that's something I try to do in my life, but they miss the most logical explanation for this story that anybody could ever have. Is that it's not about the death, Tony. It's about the resurrection. <laughs> Without the resurrection, we couldn't have the death. His logic didn't solve that one for him. I could go a hundred different directions with this scripture. This scripture has probably been preached and taught about more than any other scripture in the Bible. Uh, if Ronnie was here this morning, he would have took it a different direction. If uh, Brother Andy taught it this morning, he would have did something different with it. And if Zach taught this morning, he would have did something different with it. But I'm only going to do what the Lord put on my heart this morning. So be much in prayer for me. Bless you, brother. We're in John chapter 19. Start with verse 17. I'll read the scripture first. Be much in prayer that I'll just start preaching. And I try to teach this Sunday school lesson. I'm not here to preach. I'm just here to teach a Sunday school lesson this morning. John chapter 19, start with verse 17. Whenever you're there, say amen. 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 All right. John chapter 19, starting at verse 17, it says, And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. And now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, Therefore amongst themselves let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. And these things, therefore, the soldiers did. And verse 25 says, now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clephas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by them, whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And then saith he to his disciples, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciples took her unto his own home, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things are now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was a set, a vessel full of vinegar, and that they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it into his mouth. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. It's very easy for somebody to say that they made Jesus do this. They arrested him. They arrested him. They forced him into trial. And James, after the trial, they forced him to pick up his cross and they forced him up that hill. And they forced him down onto the cross and they drove the nails through his hands and his feet. They 
forced the spear through his side. They forced him to hang there all day. And finally, they forced him to drink of the, the sour wine, the vinegar, nope. until he died. They forced him into the grave. Oh, my bread. They forced him to submit. They killed Jesus. The soldiers did it. He was on the cross. And I, I can't disagree with him. I said they killed Jesus. They did awful things to him. I, I wouldn't have made it half the time he did. He was beaten and battered and just about destroyed. He, if he came down off of that cross, he wouldn't have been able to move a, a muscle in his body. He made it way farther than I ever could. But he did it for all of us. Starting with everything leading up to the cross. He pushed through all of it. And we've heard about it through this, this study through the book of John. And it's, it's been a great Sunday school lesson throughout. And I'm happy to, to have been asked to do this this morning. Starting with all of this, time after time, when we saw miracles of Jesus. John, uh, my favorite of the Gospels. <coughs> All of the Gospels, you can read it and see different accounts. If you ask me a story, I'd tell it differently than Richard would, and Richard would tell it differently. It's good to have different accounts of things, just as we teach our Sunday school lessons differently. Starting with everything leading up to the cross. I like to think through all of this, Jesus ultimately knew what it had to, what it had to come to. He knew all along what the, the final part of the story was. And uh, he didn't let it be known. Now, if he told his disciples first up, look guys, at the end of this they're going to crucify me and uh, this and that, so I, it wouldn't have been as great as it was, I don't think. He didn't tell them how the story was going to end. But he kept pushing through even though he knew. But coming up to where we are now, Andy taught a wonderful lesson last week on the trial and Jesus carrying the cross. Starting with the trial, Jesus faced multiple over a, a course of a couple hours. We don't get specific details about many of them. We don't know what kind of witnesses there were or what kind of trial he had, what kind of arguments. He had lawyers. He had, there wasn't any of that. We just were told that Jesus faced multiple trials. And I don't think Jesus needed a lawyer. I don't think Jesus tried to argue his defense against these trials even though he didn't do any wrong. You can read about it all the time. There are people who are wrongly accused of things because evidence shows that they were here in the wrong place at the wrong time, Tony. And it happens. People, and today in our society, go to jail for years and years. And they didn't even do anything wrong. And finally, uh, maybe after a few years, they, some evidence comes up and shows it wasn't them. But they lost all of that time of their life. And there's nothing they can really do about it. Because the jury, whether in our country or the other countries around the world, decided that they thought he did there's nothing they can do about it. Maybe they can give them a little bit of money to say we're sorry. But there have been people who have been in prison for 50 years for something they never did. Come on, buddy. And at the end of the day, they let them out and say we're sorry and maybe, maybe give them a check for a little bit of money and that's the best they can do. But I don't think during this trial, Jesus hired a lawyer, Bobby, I don't think he argued, if there was a jury, I don't think he argued with the judge, or the king. He went to the next person in charge. I don't think he argued with that one. I wish I knew the exact words that he said, and one day we're going to know. I want to know the whole story, every detail, every word that was said. But I, I like to think Jesus just sit there right on that trial and just shook his head, went on to the next one. Next to carrying the cross. As, to, or as Andy taught last week, a wonderful lesson. Like I said, it's easy for somebody to say that they forced Jesus to do it. And it's often, it's often taught that 
the disciples failed in, in helping him carry it. They walked right along next to him or behind him up the mountain outside of the city, up onto the hill Golgotha, which means Calvary. It's often taught that the disciples, it, it, you'd think that they would have helped him. Nancy, you think that you see their Lord and Savior, they knew who he was. The people around them knew who he was. You'd think they would have said, hey, let me help you out, brother. But they didn't. And Jesus made it to the top anyway. They didn't force him. I bet his body got tired and he might have stopped for a second to catch his breath. But he picked it back up and kept going. Because he wanted to for you and I. By will, they didn't force him up that mountain. They could have. And if he decided he wasn't going, I bet they would have. Because he had been tried for treason against them for saying that he's the king. But Jesus made it to the top for you and I. Next, as Brother Andy said, driving the nails in his hands and his feet, I don't think he fought against them. I think he probably just laid his hands there like that and just let it happen. The truck. Drove that nails through his hands and his feet. Not to say that it didn't hurt him. I couldn't imagine what, what it felt like to have nails that looked like railroad ties going through your hands and your feet to hold 200 pound man up on a piece of wood way up in the air and that brings us to where we are in the scripture here chapter 19 verses 17 through 30 they're hanging there Jesus and the thief on both sides with his mom at his feet watching his mom's sister the disciples were there all watching somebody they followed for a long while at this point, hanging there on the cross, and there was nothing they could do about it. He was hanging there with a sign over his head that said, King of the Jews. And all while all this was happening, the thieves who were hanging there, who, who justly <coughs> deserved this, this, uh, decision, they were actually criminals. They were hanging there next to him. That's what the, the jury of the time decided they were going to get for their crimes. And we, we often think down on this first thief. He was hanging there, serving the time for his crime, and he said, All right, Jesus, you're the big man. Get us off of here. I know you can do it. We often think, man, how is it that he would be mocking our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? But there's times we might not say it like that. We might not think it that way, but we do the exact same thing when we pray sometimes. Lord, I know you can heal me. I need you to heal me right now. Lord, I need this, and I need it more than anything. I need it right now. I know you can give it to me. I'm not perfect. If I was hanging there on a cross with nails through my hands next to Jesus, I'd want him to get me down too. And Jesus could have. Jesus could have taken them all three down. <clears throat> Jesus could have taken, become king of all the nation, all of the world. He had the power to do it, but he did it. He pushed through, carried his cross up the mountain, let them put the nails through his hands and his feet, hung there, had a spear through his side, taunted, whipped, and beaten. There's, there's movies that try to explain and show what it looked like. Movies that are so graphic they get a rated R. Uh, uh, description for in the movie theaters, movies like Passion of the Christ, it was rated dark because of how nasty and, and bloody and gory it was. And, and the, the actors of Passion of the Christ, the, I can't think of his name off the top of my head, but the person who portrayed Jesus in that movie hung there and he got sick. He had pneumonia by the end of it. He had broken bones and, and pulled muscles from hanging there. And that's not even the half of it, Richard. 
They tried to portray it, but they could never get it across in a way such that we could even imagine what it was like. Bless you, Brian. And as I said, he, he is the Savior, the King of Kings, the King of the Jews. He could have gotten it down the snap of a fingers if he wanted to. He sure could have. Yeah. And the thief was right in that, in saying that I know you can do it. Get us down off of here. But he did it. One of the best parts I, I never thought of and, until studying this week for this. In verse 30, it says, let's read it again here. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. They didn't make him drink it. This vinegar, or sour wine, this is something that the poor and the people of the fields drank. This wasn't the wine of a, a king. Kings had nice wine that tasted good. This was vinegar. The Bible doesn't even call it wine. It just says vinegar. It's great flavored vinegar. I'm not drinking that, Josh. But they gave it to Jesus. They very simply could have wretched up there and dumped it down his throat, but it says Jesus partook it. He received it. They didn't make him. And he had been through so much torment, he was beaten and battered, bruised, scarred, dehydrated. I don't think he could say another word. The sour wine, all Jesus needed was just one more drink, enough, so that he could parch his thirst just enough so he could say three more words. Jesus partook. They didn't make him. He took a drink of that sour grape vinegar just enough to get his thirst so he could say it is finished. Now we now know what that means. But I don't think those soldiers knew at the time. They watched him die and everything that came after this. They took him down, moved him to the tomb. I'm not getting too far ahead of myself here. Our teachers will have the, the chance to teach you all about that in the coming weeks. I don't think Jesus can say another word, but he took all that he could take, got one last drink of that vinegar and said, It is finished. For you and I, willingly by choice, And all of that, hanging there, king of the Jews. You could take his crown, Richard, and he'd still be king. You could take his robe, and he'd still be king. <laughs> you could take his throne, he'd still be king. Amen. You could even take his life, he'd still be king. At Easter time, we don't celebrate him dying on the cross. But we know what's coming next. I, I preached the message multiple times. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Amen. You could take all of the things this world gave him, his life, the crown of thorns on his head. You could take the nails out of his hand, you could get rid of the cross. Even before that, he was king. And he's still king today. And that's the question I ask you today. He was king of the Jews. He died for all of us. Is he king of your life? That's my lesson. Bless you. Bless you.